said earlier, you really have to rely on efficient operation so that if you can actually build a uh, profit margin advantage when you compare to uh, the industry average, uh, if you say 3%, 4% is the industry average historically, you know, the, uh, in terms of profit, then if you can actually better that by another 3 to 4%, you would be pretty safe that when the market falls, the industry gets into the red, and the industry on the whole cannot afford losing so much money, then industry collectively, by individual decision, will have to raise the freight rate. So that in that sense, that, you know, good times, you make a lot of profit, bad time, you're trying to stay even queue without losing anything. Right. So that really yeah. is the key, I think. So it's gonna keep going. Uh, you've got to wait for demand to catch up, but in the meantime, you've got to be efficient to yep. survive. Yep. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, in, in the back over there. Please. Uh, Joseph Poon from TCC Group, not a container shipping company, as CC knows. CC, I, I think you're like uh, Harry Krabs. <laughs> uh, we, we know that you know, some years ago, not that long ago, the, most, uh, the best and the most expensive Harry Krabs were shipped to uh, Japan and Hong Kong for consumption, but now, you know, it's the, the best ones stay inside China. And I just want to talk about some macro issues. A endogenous to China, we know that the 12 five-year plan and the forthcoming 13th uh, all talk about, you know, resource management, environment, uh, moderate, uh, well-to-do, you know, the, the Xiao Kang, the Chuan Men Xiao Kang concept. There's nothing about trade, uh, manufacturing based on low cost and shipping out. That's all history. And exogenous to China, you know, there's a lot of talk about moving manufacturing back to Japan on currency reasons, back to the States for uh, patriotic reasons, and also maybe the, the, advent, uh, the advantage of the U.S. in energy cost. And in Europe itself, uh, we've seen how uh, in, in the tax, Zara, uh, demonstrating the best business model, retaining manufacturing within uh, Europe, very close to the home markets, despite the perceived high cost and all that. And then you talked about e-commerce and the Silk Road. E-commerce is really about delivering products to consumers' home, bypassing the shopping malls and so on. Now, in, in, under these uh, macro forces, I know they're not going to change overnight. Wouldn't you consider building a fleet of speedboats carrying 26 to 260 containers, delivering goods uh, to all parts of Europe, not just to big hubs? And you know, are you worried about these uh, big trends uh, uh, changing the business model and killing the, the super-sized container ship model? Thank you, Joseph. I, I have to say, currently, I'm not worried because if you look at the manufacturing base in China or in Asia, what's been built up is a cluster of all activities around manufacturing. Apart from skilled labor, you have this cluster, you have this infrastructure, which I think will be very difficult to replicate in any country. And on top of which, the consumer goods that we manufacture in Asia are really more of a daily necessity. Cost is very important. And so therefore, we continue to be manufactured on a production line basis. And I don't think you know, that can be moved efficiently, or even if it's moved back to Mexico, Central America, or United States, cost-wise, it would not be competitive. So over the last three years, I think the topic of onshoring, nearshoring, you know, if we look at our volume activities, it has not been reduced, although the growth has been less, but I attribute that to the overall economy, you know, being you are still under recovery, but the recovery has been very, very, you know, the tentative. Mm. So I, I, I'm currently not worried for the time being. Yeah. So I think that question was a lot about the shift in manufacturing, but m maybe to ask a, another question that I, I think is on a lot of people's minds, how serious is the slowdown in China now? And do you see any statistics uh, in your business that indicate that it's worse than people imagine or better than people fear? 
I think China export is still growing in the single digit sort of environment. And the country is trying very hard. I think because of even you know, free market economy, they know they are not competitive manufacturing low end consumer goods. They are trying to go up the value chain. Uh, they're very focused on technology, you know, exporting technology as well. So in that sense, I think China is trying to maintain a single digit growth in terms of export and while building up the domestic consumption, which good part of it will be manufactured locally. So in terms of manufacturing, I don't think China is going to lose manufacturing. What they're trying to do is, in fact, trying to increase uh, the service sector activities within, uh, within the country. Yeah. Right. Uh, Tolgari from BI Norwegian Business School. I would like to go back again to Andreas's question about this tendency to build over capacity. It seems like it's sort of a sort of part of this inherent part of this industry. Or are there drivers that that causes this? Too easy credit, too aggressive yards, too rich ship owners. Why is it that we always accept it's good for consumers, but why should we always have excess capacity? I. <laughs> I think shipping people, particularly in container shipping, uh, all the CEO has a huge ego. <laughs> <laughs> and in good times, we all want to increase our profitability. And therefore, you know, we're trying to build size, you know, and believing the size can be absorbed at the same time we gain efficiency and hence profitability. And as I say, you know, traditionally, when you have a recession, one, two years, you're coming out of recession, you recover, and the game continues. You know, so that usually become a hiccup. But this time round, I think, you know, we're into the sixth year of recovery, and yet the consumer spending, to me, is still rather weak, the growth of consumer spending. So in the sense that when the big ship come in, you see the cost advantage, those that does not have, in order to compete, I think they are forced to order. Yeah. First, uh, first question, uh, answer I would like to give you. Secondly, I think you're right. Money is freely available. Even in the worst time, you know, when the banks are not lending, there are private equity investors, there are uh, traditional ship owning business find this is a good opportunity to invest in ship because the shipyard are hungry and they are quoting lower price. So operator will find multitude of interested party to provide funding to build ships and therefore they are able to employ, you know, on the time charter or bearable charter. So the availability of ships is always there. So big egos and easy money is a toxic combination. Um, you know, I want to give this side of the room a chance to ask some questions, but Stuhle Henriksen, uh, you had a question first, and then I'll turn it uh, more towards this side. Stuhle. Thanks a lot, Stuhle Henriksen, the Norwegian Ship Owners Association. Thank you, Mr. Tong, for a most in, uh, interesting uh, lecture. I have a question in the macroeconomic uh, realm, and that relates to your uh, comment on the lack of progress in the Doha round. We see now the emergence of uh, uh, large uh, regional free trade agreements between US and Europe, within Asia, between Asia and the US. Do you consider these to be promoting global uh, trade or are you concerned that they may serve to establish concentric circles of regional uh, protect, uh, protectionism? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to clarify one thing. You know, we talk about microeconomics. I'm not an economist. I read, you know, I'm interested in the development, you know, microeconomics. So what I talked about is really my own interpretation. Uh, in terms of uh, parallel trade packs, for me, I think it's good in the sense that as long as we are genuinely moving towards 
promotion of trade and investment. It is good for economy. So if you have one pack, you have two pack, you have three packs, I think the more the merrier, as long as you genuinely can actually operate uh, under whatever free trade agreement you have arrived at, and in fact, you see the growth of trade. You know. So for me, I, I don't think it is a competition. It is sort of a complementary. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Takos. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Tang. Thank you very much for uh, allowing us in the insights of, uh, of your cooperation. I think it is a, a very exciting uh, journey. And uh, also, I would like to congratulate the organizers uh, in Singapore for making us feel, uh, for making shipping uh, feel very much at home. I think it's a, it's a place, it's a real uh, shipping cluster and hub that, we are, uh, that makes us feel very comfortable. And my question has to do really with the image of our industry. Uh, be it containers, be it tankers, be it uh, dry cargoes. Uh, I think there are very few places in the world where shipping is appreciated as much as it is here in Singapore. I mean, I believe, and I don't, I don't think I'm big-headed, or neither of you here, that uh, we provide a huge service to the world economy with uh, you know, what we do uh, very, very, uh, I think, uh, safely, efficiently, economically, environmentally friendly, day in, day out. And the only time we get any credit, or not credit, the only time we get any uh, mention of what we do is when we have an accident or, uh, you know, when we have a couple of, uh, you know, problems uh, on the ships. That's the only press we get. And I would like to ask with your experience seeing this industry uh, going through various uh, phases, is there something that uh, you would let us know how we could handle it better? Because it seems so far we're not getting a across the message. Thank you very much. Thank you for raising this question, and uh, interestingly enough, before this session, we were just talking with uh, Minister Thieu on this subject, you know, how can we actually, what could we do, how can we do better to promote the industry? And the specific point raised was that the media does not do any service to our industry, because every time you read a news article on the newspaper, it is about piracy, it is about collision, it is about uh, pollution, you know, an accident, which is, you know, the, because of human error, and then they talk about, you know, lack of training of crew, and so on and so forth. So the question, it's a, it's a, it's a question that's been with us for a long time, you know. In fact, it is always raised in any association or association meeting that I have been with, involved with. So the short answer is I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me um, stay on this question of, of people and maybe turn it around um, and ask you, what, what are you looking for now when you're hiring people in OOCL? What are the qualities that you, you look for and can you find them in Hong Kong and Singapore for that matter? I think our company, because it's in container shipping, it's somewhat different because what we recruit is university graduate, usually MBA graduate. And we first look at personality, uh, willingness, willingness, in other words, you know, projects the willingness to work, to learn. You know. And most of the recruits have nothing to do with shipping. Usually, either in, could be in history, could be in literature, because we felt that container shipping as a business, it's now so process-oriented, you know, in terms of operation. In terms of commercial decision, it is really common sense. So the requirement is very simple, you know. We don't need any industry knowledge. We prefer to recruit them into the company and then train them, you know, so that to see which particular area of interest they have, and then we will assign job to them. And, and maybe still on this topic of people, you talked a lot earlier about IT yeah. and what's happening in the IT field. How many IT people do you have? How much do you spend on <laughs> IT, uh, if it's not too much of a trade secret? No, 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 no. And, uh, you know, quality of people that can help to keep moving that forwards. Yeah. Uh, in our company, I think 
The biggest department, in fact, is IT. You know, we have close to about 15% of our manpower is in IT. You know, both development and maintenance. You know. And uh, fortunately, I think the business has expanded so much. Uh, our IT spending is currently below 1.5% of our revenue. Mm. Yeah. That includes all development as well as operation. IT. So I'm reasonably happy with that. Yeah. Okay. And I think the other element uh, I'd like to add, uh, many of you does not know, uh, we are confident in our ability, not because we know, you know what's good for the company. We develop a system at a time, my only question is that when everybody look at IT development costs, is an actual expenditure, it's a cost. To us, we look at it as an investment. So I asked my colleague, our CIO, I said, tell me how much you're bringing back in terms of investment. What is the return? I think we spent more than a year debating how we measure the success of IT development. I think we come to a conclusion, we said, look, IT helps you to operate business more efficient. So if we can operate better than others, then we are successful. And if in a very bad market when the industry is losing money, we can stay break even. That's the definition of success. So gradually we develop a, you know, a metric to measure the success. And to the extent, ultimately, we were able to sell our proprietary system to our competitor, in fact, twice. Yeah. So uh, the boost in confidence comes from the ability to sell the system because other appreciates the benefit you know, of the system can bring to them. So in that sense, we thought you know, we should continue to invest in this right. particular area. I'm going to ask one more question about IT before opening it up to the floor again. You talked about predictive technology. Um, I'm told Google knows what I'm going to buy before I do now. Um, how close are container companies to understanding flows before they happen, what the movements are going to be? And, and I'll tack on a, a related question, which is you talk about the power of IT. Can you share with us any stories of missteps or you know, big regrets that you've had in, in IT investments in the past? Because we're all trying to figure out IT, and I think some of us are getting it, uh, let's say, more right than others. I think you know, the two particular, I wouldn't say example, but my understanding I can uh, mention here. On the predictive mode of IT operation, if we look at operation side, in our accounting, you know, each vessel left the loading port, goes to the discharging port, and come back to the loading port, as considered as complete voyage. And our accounting is done on that basis. So at the time of leaving, let's say, Hong Kong, we are actually carrying cargo. We have book cargo. Based on a cost structure, it's not of the current voyage. It's of historical data. So we use the historical data to price our product. And that's very dangerous because things change because the cargo may assign at one destination, but halfway through, it could be changed. You know? So what the system we hope can do is constantly updating information for us so that we are closer and closer to more current information in, provi in provisioning our costs and therefore giving us more real costs that we anticipate. Uh, and that also depending on the, each customer's trade pattern, where are they going where are they coming from in terms of cargo so that we can estimate the cost structure. So with that, I think it will give us a better yield manager on the cost side. And on the 
Customer side, basically you look at historical trading pattern. And with the information we have, we can then try to explore, you know, and anticipate, you know, some of their shipments. Yeah. And then we can approach a customer and basically work with them on the future plans. Yeah. Any IT disaster stories or regrets? Not so much as re regrets, but I think in the initial phase of IT, it was very painful adjustment. You know, and to the extent that uh, we have to change the business process completely uh, during the inception or implementation of the IT system back in the year 2000, it took two full years and two years of parallel run of the operating system, which is not mature, which is not well understood, and parallel run with a manual operation. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> a lot of overtime, a lot of extra hands managing it. Right. That was really painful. Yeah. Thank you. Andrew Tan. Thank you, Mr. Tung, for accepting this lecture and providing your candid uh, comments. Earlier this, or in fact, uh, earlier this week, uh, we had a meeting of the first uh, Port Authorities Roundtable, where gathered in Singapore were the Port Authorities uh, on the East-West uh, trade. Um, on part of Asia, we had Ningpo, we had uh, <coughs> Busan, we had Tokyo, some Southeast Asian ports, Port Klang, Singapore, of course. On the European side, we had Antwerp and the Port of Rotterdam. And one of the points that surfaced was that